My name is Lauren. I am a survivor of domestic abuse. Today, I am breaking my silence. Lauren, how old were you when you had your daughter? I was 17 when I had my daughter. Young, right? Very young, yeah. How did you feel having a child so young? I actually was really excited. I knew, I always thought I'd be able to do it. I had everyone telling me, you won't be able to do it. But I think she was really the only thing that was keeping me going at the time. What was happening at the time? Though? I think I was realising that the relationship I was in wasn't okay. And I think that was what I was holding on to, to kind of change it and make it okay. Yeah, I don't know. I think that was the only love I felt in that relationship was a love that I had for my unborn child. Was the pregnancy stressful? Yeah, so obviously I'd got hooked on cocaine prior to falling pregnant in that relationship. I started realising that obviously I wasn't able to eat or drink and keep it down and stuff and I was being so sick and I think I obviously wasn't then able to take the cocaine and stuff so I started on like a come down and it got really bad and then I was in hospital by the time I was six weeks pregnant I think and yeah the, obviously the pregnancy was just stressful because I didn't obviously have much support from him he wasn't on board with he didn't want the pregnancy. What kind of abuse was he subjecting you to? So it started off as emotional and then when I told him I was pregnant, he kicked me in my stomach and that was probably the first physical altercation. From then it was just a case of he was always targeting my belly because he wanted me to have an abortion and obviously I was only 16 or just turned 17 when I found out I was pregnant and he was 25 at the time. He had told me, you know, I've made seven different girls or I've killed seven babies before, there's no way a kid's going to have mine and things like that. So. The abuse was always very focused around my stomach and obviously trying to, like, basically kill the child and things like that. As I started getting, like, showing more and my bump was getting bigger and we had announced it, obviously I think he realised he, it's happening, the baby's coming, um, and he obviously didn't want anyone knowing what he was like and things, so that's when it just turned into a lot of suffocation and strangulation and, yeah, just all sorts, really. What was going on for you emotionally at the time? What was it like to be you? I was quite numb at the time, to be honest. I just, I didn't really, I was just so lost. I kind of left my mum's house. My mum was so overprotective and I'd run off with this old guy that I wasn't meant to be doing and things like that. And I'd moved in with him after two weeks. I was hooked on cocaine and didn't know how to tell my mum. And I was so trapped in that moment that I didn't, I, did, I didn't really see reality. I didn't, I was just in that moment at that time. So there was never really much space for you to ask for help? No, majority of my friends him? knew what was, was going on, but they all had quite a good friendship with him, and he's, you know, very charming and can get on really well with other people. There's only so many times they can tell you to leave and give you that advice, and there was enough times that they'd pick me up and take me back to theirs, and I remember one of my friends took me for one of my first scans and things because he had hit me before and I didn't want him coming with me, and, you know, there's friends that had took me to the hospital after he'd hit me because I was, you know, worried and felt no, like, movements and things like that. They always then got the phone call 24 hours later saying, don't suppose you could take me back. I need a lift back to his, and so I think they kind of gave up in the end with trying to help. You just spent the whole pregnancy terrified. Yeah, yeah. I was very close, well, I thought I was close to his mum, so during the pregnancy, I, she was my support, and then it was only towards the end that I realised it wasn't necessarily support and that she was actually, like, enabling and encouraging and, to be honest, one of the main reasons for what was going on. That must have been so suffocating, having all of these people around yeah. enabling a perpetrator. Yeah, I didn't have any family. Obviously, I'd isolated myself from my family because I didn't want... And because I knew my mum had been through it with my dad, I knew she wasn't stupid, I knew she'd pick up on it. And I'd, you know, said to her before, when she was saying, I can't let you be with a 25-year-old, and I was saying, but he's so nice, and I'd given that whole speech about how nice this person was. And it was just, I think, I was embarrassed to have to say to her, you know, like, I have messed up, and... I should have listened to you. At what point did you then say, I need help? I think it was around the time of my labour, because he never come to me for, like, the appointments or anything like that. You know, I started having contractions at half seven in the morning, and I just remember him going mad at me for waking him up. All day he was like, you better clean the house, you better do this, make sure it's, like, in shape when the baby gets here. And I remember I was... But it was about, I don't know, midday at this point, and he had me carrying the Henry Hoover up the stairs, hoovering the stairs and stuff. And I was in agony, I was having contractions. And I just remember his brother turned up and he was like, what are you doing? Like, you're, you're in labour, chill out. And he uh, was rude about me, basically. And then my mum turned up and 
I don't know, I, that's the first time I noticed like the mask kind of slipped. He couldn't even put up the front in front of my mum. He was very much getting irritated by the fact that I was getting attention. And even in the hospital when I was in the like bed, um, dilating and he's telling me you know stop attention seeking stop exaggerating man up stop being a baby and, and I just remember looking at my mum saying I'm gonna kill him like get him out of the room I'm gonna kill him and and then he was asleep in my hospital bed and I'm at the end of the bed like trying to push a baby out and he wasn't supportive through the labour or anything and then I remember my friend come round to meet the baby and she noticed a few bruises and things and I just remember she said to me like you don't need to tell me but I can tell like is everything okay and I just said by the time my child's six months old I'll, I'll be out of here I promise I just need this six months to work out how I'm gonna do it. My daughter was born on the 11th of July and I left him on the, in the January of the next year so it literally was six months later I managed to, well I say I left him he actually kicked me out but. What was the fleeing? experience process like for you? What is in getting away from the relationship? Well, he actually ended the relationship. He was obviously cheating and doing all his things and getting caught out for a lot of things. And he kicked me out and once again, I kind of left, went back to my mum's. The mum basically dropped me at the mum's. So he had hit me that day. I had like marks under my eyes, my kneecaps and things. I could barely walk, it was about 10 o'clock in the morning. And I remember ringing his mum and saying, like, he's going to kill me, you need to come and get me. And I remember her just saying, like, honey, I'm doing the horses, you'll have to wait. And then he rung his mum and said, like, listen, this time I'm actually going to kill her, you need to come and get her out of my house now. And she did turn up. I just remember, obviously, my washing up wasn't done, and I remember her just walking in and she just kind of tutted at me and said, like, you can't even keep your kitchen clean or something like that, and snatched my daughter out of my arms and just basically said, like, it's my fault, I push his buttons and all of these things and I just remember even then he's literally begging her saying please just get this girl out of my house I'm going to kill her I'm gonna hurt her and I just remember her saying but I can't I can't take her back to her mum look at her and then I think that was when she finally like realized how bad it was I think she thought oh shit how am I gonna take this girl back to her mum I'm not gonna be able to and I remember she sat me there for about 45 minutes with my makeup because I'd bought um, a foundation called Dermacol, it's for tattoos, to cover up tattoos. I remember I said to her, like, I've got this makeup, it'll cover my bruises, you can take me back to my mum. And she sat there for about 45 minutes just trying to cover it. And then I just remember, yeah, she just dropped me to my mum. And I remember even on the way to my mum, she's coming up with this little plan of what I'm going to say and the excuses. And I remember when we turned up, my mum was so surprised, she hadn't seen me for ages. And I've just turned up with all my stuff and a baby. And she literally just turned around and said, everything's fine, Lauren and, you know, have just had a little row, they'll be absolutely fine, she'll be back tomorrow. And then I come in, acted like nothing happened, went to sleep with my makeup on and obviously woke up and it had all come off. My mum walked in, saw my nose and my eyes and that was it, I never went back. My mum didn't let me. What was that moment like between you and your mum when, when, as you said, the mask completely gone now? There's no makeup to even cover the bruises. I think it's the first time that I felt like my mum cared. Like, I know it sounds bad, I know my mum cares, I know she's always cared, but my mum really struggles to show sympathy. And I think that was that one time she actually realised she's been suffering in silence, you know what I mean? And she has been oblivious to it all. Like, there was a couple of times I'd turn up during the relationship and had a few, like, grab marks on my arm and, and my mum would question me, but obviously it's easy to come up with an excuse at the time, which is why I just stopped going, because after a few excuses, there's only so many times you can say the same one over and over. You've spent some time in refuges. Talk to me, tell me what that's been like. If I'm honest, I'd say that the actual refuge experience probably re-traumatised me all over again. Not something I'd personally recommend off my own experiences. I think there's a lot of change that needs to happen within the system. It needs to be charity run and not just companies that obviously want to make a bit of money and things like that. The first refuge I fled to, obviously I had no intention of ever fleeing. I'd never thought I'd leave my family. Um, I'm from a little village with all my family, literally within walking distance. Social services had closed the case and everything, everything had been fine. And then a week later, he had done something and they just basically rung me and said, you've got 24 hours to move into another county with your daughter, into refuge. If you don't do it, we're gonna take like legal action. You've got to safeguard your daughter. So I did, I packed myself that night and left the following morning and went into refuge. The re refuge itself, there was no staff, there was no security, there was random men coming in and out. That wasn't a good experience in itself. And then I managed to get housed, but I had to private rent, they wouldn't obviously help me and stuff. I got a phone call one day when I was in Asda's 
and it was a police officer asking for my current address and I had explained to him that like, I don't feel comfortable giving my current address because I don't want it to be on any system and things and I'd explained that I'd had problems with an officer before leaking information and I was promised, you know, it's all confidential, we need it to put markers on your address and to safeguard you. So I gave my address. I just got a bad feeling the minute I'd done it, so I rung back an hour later to 101. There was no log of any call being made to me. So then i have done my own investigation. Social services got back to me and said that probation had been in contact and knew where I was residing, basically, so it was clear that the leak had happened. I got a big investigation done and the officer is now a sergeant, and the, it does show that there is a call traced back from her like um, area and things like that, but it's not logged, it's not recorded, there's no extension number, so there's no proof. So the investigation's been deemed as the police have made no mistakes, and it's fine. So many failings, right? Mm. People yeah. were supposed to keep you safe. Yeah, and that's why I've got no trust in the police at all anymore. It's totally understandable, yeah. because... They were supposed to keep you safe in a way. 100%. From harm. And he was in he was in custody at the time, so there's no way of him really have been able to have get my address. Do you know what I mean? It was a week before his release and it was that anxiety of knowing like he's he's out now, he can just come. And my friend that was living locally was also a mutual friend and I think that's one of the biggest things is just realising that not everyone's got your best intentions. Do you know what I mean? You can't be so trusting of everyone and yeah. I've had to cut off any mutuals I've had to cut off. There's just I can't risk it. You've had to do what yeah. you need to do yeah. to keep yourself safe, to protect yeah. you and your child now, right? Yeah. And so talk, tell me what your life is like now. So we're happy and we're, we're settled where we are. Out of all the places, it's probably the best place for me to be with her. It's still a struggle. It's just, it's not something that leaves. I feel, I feel free to walk down the road, you know, not have to look over my shoulder and things like that. It's sad not being able to share anything I'm doing and I've got to worry about whether information gets back to him and... Yeah, and I need to get into work and things like that, but it's just like, even my anxiety, I'm just still, I'm still at that stage where I'm trying to work on myself and trying to love myself again. And What do you think that you would benefit the most from um, help-wise if someone said, you know, there's therapy available? I am on the waiting list for therapy, but obviously it's just a case of, I think, three years minimum probably for me to get anywhere with it. Yeah, I think therapy is needed, definitely. Or even, I've always wanted to go into work of, like I even said to the refuge, is there no way of me coming back and kind of helping the girls? Do you know what I mean? I was the one that was kind of doing all the staff's work and cooking all the kids their dinners and things like that. And But then I, I've took a lot to realise it, it is me that I need to work on first and I need to deal with my own stuff before I try and help other people's. Did you experience any sexual abuse and violence whilst you were with your perpetrator? Uh, yeah, so the, I'd say the sexual was probably the most frequent um, abuse that I probably experienced. It wasn't necessarily... I think it took me a while to accept that I had experienced that because it wasn't a case of being, you know, pinned down and all the typical things that everyone just assumes, like, sexual assault is. Um, and I think stemming from being abused or sexually assaulted when I was three... Um, it was just that embarrassment to admit that I'd kind of let it happen to myself again. And when you're in a relationship, that's your boyfriend, so I don't think you realise that it's wrong, you know, to him. I'm the mother of his child, I'm in a relationship with him, I should put out whenever I'm asked to put out, basically. Um, and I think most of the times I didn't really think that it was an assault because... I'd said no like 10, 20 times, but eventually I'd give in, and because I've given in and not fought back, I just thought, you know, it, it was consensual. Um, it's only after realising how many times, you know, I'd, I could be crying during it, and it'd be, if anything, like turning him on and he'd want to continue. And it's now when I think back to it, I just think they were all assaults and they, they weren't consensual. Um, and I think because I haven't pressed charges, that's my biggest, biggest thing that... You know, like, I won't be believed and things like that, but from what happened when I was three, like, my mum didn't really, like, go through with the charges and things, and I had to take it upon myself at 14 to, like, take that to court, and I got bullied, I had to move schools, no-one believed me. And I did get the guilty verdict and stuff, and I think I'm just so scared of getting a not guilty with this that I don't think, I'm, I don't think I'll ever seek that conviction. I don't... I'll, I'll live with that myself. Um, but when people say to me, you know, why don't you let this man around your kids? She's, he wouldn't harm her and things like that. And I think if a man can 
talk about the things he spoke about when I was three and in the way that he did. And you know, the threats he made to have my six-year-old brother um, tied up to a tree and raped in front of me and my mum and set on fire. And then he was going to do the same to my mum and watch my make my little brother watch. And this big black plan that he'd come up with in his head that he was going to do to us. And one, it put fear in me anyway, obviously, for my little brother and stuff. But it's just not a man I ever want around, around my child. I don't want a man that can speak about a child in that way um, around him, no. What would it mean for you to just be believed, just you were sexually assaulted? What would um, it mean for someone to just say, I believe you? I think that's all I need to hear, to be honest. I think it's all I've ever needed to hear as a child, as a teenager, as an adult. Um, I don't know, like, I've just always felt like I'm the reason for it. I've always felt like a slag. I've just, I've lived my life to please men. And Day. I feel like I've let so many people take advantage of me. <laughs> I should have been stronger, I should have said no. Lauren. I just think even when I was 14, I'm sleeping with 22 year old men <laughs> because I want an older man and I want to be, do you know what I mean, attractive to these older men. I remember flirting with teachers to try and get the teachers' attention. <laughs> and then I just feel like. I blame myself for it all because of how provocative I was and just even now, you know, like, that's why I've come off Instagram because I'm constantly putting up a photo and I'll put a bit of cleavage in it just for the extra lights, for that attention. I've just, it's took me a long time to realise, like, just because it's attention doesn't make it the right attention, like, it has to be the right attention. And it's took me a long time to realise that, that I need to love myself first because I won't accept the love from no one else. I believe you, 100% I always have. And I don't think this was ever anything that you did wrong. And it's very clear that you were failed by adults time and time again, who should have kept you safe. Yeah. And that there is absolutely zero blame, zero shame and guilt that is on you. Yeah. I want you to feel that for yourself too. Yeah. Thank you.